Well, as Dan mentioned, uh, we are kicking off a brand new series today uh, entitled Connect, which is one of our kind of our four strategic uh, values and emphases that we talk about a lot around here. Uh, you hear it every week, uh, and that's by design. Uh, we're going to continue <laughs> to, to kind of lift that up because we want to focus in on uh, who we're trying to be and lean into that. And one of those is uh, to foster a place where not only you connect with each other, but folks in the community, our neighbors, uh, can connect with Christ through connecting with us. Uh, or as I like to say, Redeemer needs to be a place where neighbors become friends and friends become family. And it's a place where we can connect together. So we're going to be looking at this whole theme over the next several weeks of connecting. And in particular, looking at uh, the lens of relationship and community that from a sort of a biblical perspective. And today is about kind of um, laying the, the foundation for that. Uh, you know, when you, when you build a house or you've got a, a, a bricklayer, they spend a lot of time getting the foundation or the cornerstone set just right because everything else depends on that. And in a sense, the text we're going to grapple with today is sort of one of those foundational cornerstone type texts. It's Genesis 1, it's the creation account, where we, 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 we discover God sort of acting uh, in his creative way to create community, but in a very particular way. So listen in as we read a few verses. First of all, the first two verses, the writer says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then jump down, we're going to pick it up uh, in verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Don't miss that. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the uh, heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And that's where we're going to pause this morning. All of this, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these ancient words that were inspired by your Holy Spirit to capture this great mystery at the dawn of time of how this world came into being and how we, as part of it, came into being. It's fitting in some ways that we're talking about this on STEM Sunday when we're looking at some of the, the wonders and the, the, the intricacies of the created order that you made, Lord. And we're grateful and we pray your blessing on our young disciples as they're engaging with that. But Lord, help us to understand who you are, how you created us, how you wired us so that we can live into our full potential as human beings. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God is in a small group. Now that may sound a little weird on the surface. It might be a little provocative or attention-grabbing. It's actually kind of designed to be, right? It's designed to get your attention to get you thinking a little bit. Uh, it's, it's, it's not exactly true per se, but, but, I, but, but I want you to think a little bit about the very nature of God that we encounter in these opening lines of Scripture. Because the, the writer chooses their language very precisely and very carefully. The very opening line of Genesis 1 says, in the beginning what? God, right? Anybody know what that word is in the original Hebrew? It's Elohim, which is a plural word. 
In fact, the ancients used it, uh, and it's not, it's not unique to the Hebrew faith, the ancients used it a lot to describe sort of the, their understanding of the, 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 the supernatural, the, the, the divine beings, as it were, the gods with a small g. Even angelic hosts sometimes get described using that word. And so there is a sense, even though our, our initial reaction when we read those opening lines of Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, our, our initial reaction is to think of sort of a singular entity. And in fact, the writer chooses this, this plural word, I think, to, to capture a sense of the dynamism of the, the interrelatedness of the Godhead that we later come to call the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's interesting because uh, there, there is this dynamic tension in the, in the opening chapter of Genesis where, where the writer uses this plural form, Elohim, and also when he uses the pronouns for he or him, it's in the singular, which is to suggest that this, this unique kind of mysterious way that God is and that God acts is both collaborative and collegial within the Godhead, but with a singular focus, with a singular purpose, with a singular action. And there is a sense of that kind of dynamic tension that happens throughout, throughout Scripture, but particularly uh, here in this foundational text in Genesis chapter 1. Now, I will say no small measure of ink has been spilled by great thinkers and scholars, far, <laughs> far brighter than I am, who have tried to grapple with this sense of what, what, what is this thing that we call the Trinity? I mean, try to explain that to somebody over a cup of coffee at Starbucks sometime, right? But they have. They have great councils have met, creeds have been drafted. Lots of debates and arguments have taken place over what this means, particularly over the nature of Jesus as God incarnate. What does that mean, to be fully God and fully human as a member of the triune Godhead? It just gets quite challenging and baffling, but that doesn't stop thinkers and scholars from trying to grapple with it. It doesn't stop us, and we should, right? But, it, but at the end of the day, I think there's a, there's a, a reality at work here that you and I have to acknowledge, we are finite. There are things about who God is and how God operates that we cannot possibly fully grapple with. But we try to, don't we? There's a mystery, and we, sometimes we don't like to live with mystery, so we try to de-mysteryize it. That's not a word, but... We, we, we try to, right? And so we use all these ways to try to grapple with and try to explain this nature of God as three yet one, one yet three. And we use analogies and metaphors, right? You probably heard some of these. Like, God's like a flag. Three colors, one flag. God's like a, you know, a, a role in a family. A woman can be both a daughter, a mother, and a wife, but she's one person. Or, or, or natural elements from nature, right? Like water. Water can exist in three different forms, liquid, solid, and gas, but it's still water. And we try like crazy to grapple with and sort of get our, our finite minds around this great mystery that God is three persons, one being, working in concert and harmony together. And if we're honest, there's a limit to what we can truly grasp and understand. And that's where sometimes our faith comes into play. And yet, I think God gives us a little bit of a clue to his character in these opening lines from Genesis. He sort of pulls back the curtain a little bit and says, I'm going to help you, even though your mind is finite, I want to help you understand a little bit of who I am and how I operate. And that come, becomes most clear when we get to the sixth day of creation, when he creates the human race. Listen again to these words, verse 26 and 27. God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over livestock, all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Now, when you first read that, it's easy to assume that being created in God's image means to rule over, to be the, the, the superior one. And it isn't that our stewardship of creation isn't part of what the image of God 
is all about in us. It's certainly a part of it. But sometimes we reduce it down to, to, to such little sound bites. There's, there's much greater depth and mystery to what it means for you and I to be created in the image of God, or as the theologians like to refer to it, the imago Dei, the image of God in us. And sometimes we, we, we say, well, what does that mean? That means, well, we are, we are rational creatures. We can think. We have, we have moral judgment, unlike the animals. We have the ability to decide right from wrong, good from bad, truth from evil. Some say, well, well that image of God in us is, 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 is our creative capacity. It's our ability to, to sort of mirror the creative impulse of who God is. Look at this whole beginning part of Scripture. It's God creating. In the beginning, God creates. God does something. And when we do things and when we create things, we are, in fact, kind of reflecting that part of God's character. All of that's true. But, but I wonder if there's more to it than that. Because you notice in this text, he says at the very beginning, let us make humankind in our image. And he goes on to say, and so he created them, male and female. What if... What if what it means at its core to be created in God's image is to be created for relationship, to be created for community? And that when God's truest self is on display, when we are living out our role as an image bearer of the divine, what if that reaches its its most pure form when we are loving each other and caring for each other and helping each other and serving each other and prioritizing the needs of each other and loving one another. What if, what if amidst all those other understandings of what it means to be created in the image of God, what if that is the highest and purest and most essential element of what it means to be created in God's image. Because God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit function together in an unparalleled, harmonious unity. The Son is always pointing to the Father. The Father is glorifying the Son. The Spirit is always pointing us to the Son they're always working together in concert with a singular purpose and a singular will. I love the way Adam Hamilton puts it in his book, Revival. He says this, We are never more like God than when we are giving selflessly to others because God created us to live this way. We seldom feel more alive and more joyful than when we are serving, blessing, and helping someone else. Nobody's going to say amen to that? Amen. Come on, you with me? There's something about it, isn't there? You feel that, 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 that sense of I, I, I'm, I'm in sync. When I'm getting out of myself, when I'm not so absorbed in myself, my own interest, my own whatever, and I get out of myself and I, and I give myself away, and I prioritize the needs of someone else. I care about someone else. I sacrifice. I love. I serve. There's something beautifully godlike about that. And I think you see that at the very beginning of time when God creates us. And sometimes we, we have a hard time with that because we have been taught culturally to be independent, right? At least if you grew up in America, if you grew up somewhere else in a different part of the world, that might, your cultural values may be different. But if you grew up here in, in, in America, you were, from the time you were very little, our value system teaches us to try to be independent, where the biblical model is much more one of interdependency, 
within the community. But, but we fight against those cultural norms. <laughs> like my friend, uh, friends Rit and Joanne did many years ago. I was serving a different church, and they had um, recently visited and kind of found a, a place to call home at our church. And so they started settling in and making connections. And we were, as a church, trying to kind of lean into and embrace a new way of life, becoming a church less with lots of programs that you could go to and more a church that was living out at a grassroots level what it means to be a community of faith through the, through the context and the vehicle of small group life. We were trying to become a church of small groups, not a church with small groups. And so we were growing and we were seeing new groups spring up, new leaders being trained, people being welcomed. And Ritt and Joanne came in, they were both incredibly bright, successful people, worked for a major high-tech company in the area. And they came in and I was getting to know them and I said, hey, we've got some great opportunities for you. We've got some new small groups that have just started. I'd love to introduce you to those leaders, those people, and get you connected with the, those in that community. And, and they, they, they sort of graciously just sort of smiled at me and said, yeah, we're, we're not really small group kind of people, David. Okay. Not going to push that on anyone, but I wanted to encourage them because I knew how beautiful, how wonderful it can be when you connect with other people in a smaller group and there's care and there's love and there's sharing and there's serving together. And so I didn't push them, but eventually somehow, I don't, it must have been the Holy Spirit, but eventually somehow they became a little more open to the idea and they decided to try out a couple of small groups. So they did. They went to one and they found a group of folks that they really sort of meshed well with and connected with. And so they started attending their weekly small group fellowship in different people's homes. And over time, that small community of about eight to ten people became so important to them. And it became very important about a year or two later when Ritt was diagnosed with an aggressive form of brain cancer. And he went through all of the treatment. When you have brain cancer, you get one shot of radiation. And it's a, it's a big shot, but you only get one. And the odds are stacked against you. And Ritt knew that. He was at peace. But what was so remarkable to me was to watch that small group of people surround him and Joanne with their love, their care, their support. More than once, I would go to visit him in the hospital, and I would, I would be walking through the door, and I would be passing someone going the other way who was part of their small group, who had already been there. And he said to me in his dying days, David, I'm so glad you encouraged us to get involved in a small group because I don't know how we'd make it through this without them. And when he eventually passed away, we had a, we had a, a it was a traditional church with lots of structure and programs. We had a board of deacons and so forth. So normally, when we would have a memorial service or a funeral, the deacons would swing into action and plan a reception and food and all that kind of stuff. You know the drill, right? And they were prepared to do that and very glad and, and ready and willing to do that. Except his small group stepped up and said, hey, we got this. We're, we'll, we'll be happy to take care of it. And the deacons helped out a little bit, but they worked very uh, collegially and collaboratively together to put on a grand celebration of his life out at one of their homes. So we had the service in the church and the reception was out at one of their homes where they would meet and I watched that whole journey and that whole progression. And it just made it so crystal clear to me in, in ways that I've seen many times, but in this particular instance, how vitally important it is that you and I are connected with each other in meaningful and substantive ways.
There are lots of ways you can connect with people. You can share a meal together. You can even do a Bible study together. But when we talk about small groups here, we're talking about a group that's 6 to 12 people, that's meeting weekly, that's studying Scripture, that's worshiping together, that's fellowshipping, and that is serving together. All the kind of microcosmic things you do in the church, but done on a smaller scale. I'll never forget one of our small groups in another church that I was serving who took up my challenge to them to go and serve together as a small group. And there was a local um, home for uh, children who had sort of been um, abandoned by the system and their families, that many of them had uh, developmental issues and all sorts of things. And so there was a, a team of caring staff that, that cared for them in a residential facility. And I said to our small groups, I don't care where you serve, just go. Get off the couch. Set aside your normal weekly routine once every couple of months and just go serve somewhere as a group together. And so they went to this home where these kids lived, and it was a very loving, nurturing, supportive home. And they came back with countenances that were glowing. They said, it's like the best experience we've ever had as Christians because they were connecting together and they were connecting with others as they served. And in so doing, they were reflecting the most beautiful part, the essence, I believe, of what it means to be made in the image of a triune God. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking a lot more about this kind of stuff. And I just want to encourage you, if you're not in a small group, and the small group's not necessarily just a few people. <laughs> just because there's a few people in the room. It's a, it's a very particular, it's a, it's a way of life, not a program. If you're not yet in a small group, um, I want to just encourage you to, to just open up yourself up a little bit and consider that. As Dan mentioned, we have a couple that meet here on Sunday mornings. And we have a few that meet during the week. We want to start more. We'll be saying a lot more about that. But... For now, I just want to leave you with this question. God's in the small group, so should you be? <laughs> just a question. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your highly relational nature. Thank you that you love us, that you seek us out, and that you have wired us for relationship, for connection, for community. Our culture kind of just works against that by trying to isolate us and keep us independent of each other. But that's not your vision at the dawn of creation, Lord. You created us with and for each other. And God, I pray that you would, you would help us to find our way into deeper connectivity here and that others who come along in the days to come would find a place where they too can connect where they too can find safety and love and a place of belonging, a place to grow. Thank you, Father. We love you, and we are so grateful that you love us. Send us out, Lord, to be beacons of light and hope in Jesus' name. Amen.